Hello again. This is Cheryl J. Fish, and I just hit record. Uh, so I'm going to introduce Lisa and Judith before we start our program. Lisa E. Bloom is the author of many feminist books and articles um, about history, cult visual culture, and cultural studies, including Gender on Ice, American Ideologies of Polar Expeditions, with other eyes looking at race and gender in visual culture, and Jewish identities in US feminist art, Ghosts of Ethnicity. Her latest book, which she is talking about today, Climate Change and the New Polar Aesthetics, Artists Reimagine the Arctic and Antarctica, uh, is the subject of her talk. And she'll be looking at aspects of feminism and environmental art that can join with issues routinely kept out of climate change debates, such as the fate of indigenous communities, resurgent nationalities, globalizing capitalism, as well as questions of persistent post-colonial relationships. She has taught at numerous universities and art schools and currently is at UC Berkeley as research scholar in the Beatrice Bain Center in the Department of Gender and Women's Studies. Judith Hersko is an installation artist who works at the intersection of art and science and collaborates with scientists on visualizing climate change science through art and narrative. In 2008, she received the National Science Foundation Antarctic Artists and Writers Grant and spent six weeks in Antarctica. Her work has received national as well as international recognition. In 97, she represented her native Hungary at the Venice Biennale. Hersko is professor and chair in art, media and design department at Cal State San Marcos, where she initiated the art and science project. Um, and now um, Lisa will introduce me and then we'll get going. Yeah, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, um, Cheryl Fish is an environmental humanities scholar, poet and fiction writer. Her essays on indigenous Sami artists and filmmakers who challenge mining and extractivism include an article extractivism in um, Sami, in the book, Sami Elegiac in just, Eco Justice in Lizalette's Watchett's film, Karuna Road, Space Road, and Marja Helander's Silence Photographs in the collection Nordic, Nordic Narratives of Nature and the Environment. And on Sami films and forms of surveillance in Critical North's Space Nature Theory. Fish has been a Fulbright professor in Finland and is a co-editor with Farrah Griffin of The Stranger in the Village, Two Centuries of African-American Travel Literature. Fish's essay on June Jordan and Buckminster Fuller's architectural redesign of Harlem tenements in the 1960s established that collaboration and identified Jordan as an environmental justice advocate and architect. Fish also intervened at a Whitney Museum exhibit on Fuller to reinstate Jordan rightfully as initiator of the quote unquote Skyrise for Harlem project. Fish's debut novel off the um, yoga mat, um, the story of three characters coming of age was published by- Middle Living Age, coming of middle age. Coming of middle age was published by Livingston Press um, in 2022. She is the author of um, The Sauna is Full of Maids, Poems and Photographs Celebrating Finnish Sauna Culture, the Natural World and Friendships, and um, Crater and Tower, Poems Reflecting on Trauma and Ecology after the Mount St. Helens volcanic eruption and the terrorist attack of 9-11. She is a creative writing editor at the journal Ecocene um, and professor of English at BMCC CUNY and a docent lecturer at University of Helsinki. Thank you. So now let's hear Lisa give her talk. Okay. Um, I wanted to um, start just by thanking Cheryl um, for, organi for organizing and hosting this talk and to Victor um, Paul for setting up the Environmental Humanities Month in Helsinki, Finland. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, okay. And So I also wanted to say that while we meet today on a virtual platform, I would also like to take a moment to acknowledge that I'm speaking on Huchin traditional lands of the Omon people and to recognize indigenous peoples as the original stewards of the land where I now live in Berkeley, California. 
Okay, um, to begin, I wanted to start with a quote by um, the well-known um, Indian author Amitav Ghosh from his wonderful book, The Great Derangement. Um, and I quote, um, the climate crisis is also a crisis of culture and thus of the imagination. As the climate crisis becomes increasingly severe, um, Gosh reminds us that the planet risks becoming utterly unrecognizable, a world we cannot even imagine. Imagination is central to my book for expressing the strangeness unfolding around us in the Arctic and Antarctic and creating art and film and scholarship that can orient us toward a more just and resilient world in the era of the so-called Anthropocene. In what follows, the book brings art and film into conversation with new scholarship in these regions, connecting debates on science and the environment with gender, sexuality, race, and the relations of the human to the non-human. It considers resurgent nationalisms, empire, and globalizing capitalism as these forces intertwine in the polar regions. The book addresses these issues against a backdrop of climate change politics, resource extraction, and a changing geopolitical order. It ties the history of polar exploration, exploration directly to the pursuit of fuels, beginning with whaling and continuing with the drive for fossil fuel extraction in the 20th and 21st centuries. The work discussed in the final chapters understands the Arctic's acceler accelerated um, climate change, permafrost melt, and oil spills as they pertain to the slow violence against the environment. Throughout the book, the notion of slow violence, to use Rob Nixon's term as it applies to climate change, helps to describe many processes, including eroded indigenous rights, degradation of indigenous land, extinction of almost invisible species and slow or indirect forms of psychological violence. In climate change and the new polar aesthetics, global warming is no longer simply an Arctic or Antarctic story that is unfolding remotely or, un or in so-called uninhabited wastelands of little importance to the world. Rather, it's a crisis of both the human and natural world and the disasters unfolding there might start um, there, but will not be confined. Um, the book challenges the mainstream media's depiction of these regions as an iconic shorthand for communicating, communicating climate change with its focus on non-human nature forever conserved in a prehistoric timeless past, as well as the silencing of indigenous Arctic voices to frame the issue of Arctic climate change as geographically remote and psychologically distant. Contemporary discussions of present day Arctic and Antarctic anthropogenic landscapes are not any longer about contemplating from a safe remove the destruction nature might wreak in inaccessible parts of the world. Consequently, the melting of the polar ice caps is already having significant repercussions for the globe as a whole especially the continued existence of the world's coastal cities, um, such as New York, Miami, Houston, San Francisco, Amsterdam, Mumbai, Shanghai, and many others, especially the dire situation of Jakarta, um, a city of 20 million people that is currently being moved to Borneo. Yet, this earlier traditional sense of distance and remoteness contributed to the fascination of the polar regions and helped shape the globalist and colonialist histories and Western, um, colonialist Western histories and fantasies that in turn drove polar expeditions in the 19th and 20th centuries. My studies refused the distance and sense of safety um, the faraway polar regions once afforded by confronting the evidence that this polar ice has been affected by rising temperatures and that these um, changes in ice in turn contribute to the climate related crisis growing all over the world. So this section is called the aesthetics of finitude. Um, in light of the urgency of the planetary crisis, this book explores the challenge facing artists articulating a specifically critical polar aesthetics that uncovers some of, some of the forms and shapes of life in the Arctic and Antarctic under late capitalism at a moment of accelerated climate change. 
The book describes this new art as an aesthetic and sensorial phenomena that refuses the physical spectacle afforded by the old flag planting heroism of explorations to the ends of the earth. It rethinks ecology and aesthetic practice together to challenge the political and social assumptions of an earlier epic promoting imperial entitlements and unbridled capitalism. The artists and filmmakers discussed here create works that counter colonial fantasies of endless exploration and escape and instead find solace and even hope in more modest local phenomena. This is especially the case for the Inuit artists and filmmakers who inhabit parts of the circumpolar north who best understand an aesthetics of finitude and are experts on the question of how to survive and what it means to leave in, live in environmental conditions that are gradually becoming increasingly degraded. Um, these two images are from Inuit knowledge and climate change. Um, and um, it includes a discussion um, by Zacharias Kunick and Ian Mauro, the first to ask Inuit elders to describe the environmental challenges they're experiencing in Arctic Canada and Inunigit in their own Inuktitut language. Um, the documentary, oh, here's the second from that film, just, just as um, a, a shot. Um, the second one, the documentary um, film, um, Lament for the Land on a Tutnichik Nanami by Ashley Kunselow Willux and the local Inuit communities of Nunitsit, Labrador, Canada provides a striking example of how recognizing suffering from climate change in the circumpolar north can serve as a necessary first step toward the amelioration of that suffering by breaking the geographic isolation imposed on both individuals and communities in local and social, um, in local and regional contexts. Also, the experimental film, That Which Once Was by Kimi Taksue, um, is set in a future defined by climate breakdown when millions of people will be driven from their homes that already mirrors the present as climate migration is already driving migration today. Um, in the US alone, many of you will know that already over 3 million Americans um, have lost their homes and are climate refugees, according to Jack Biddle's recent book, The Great Displacement, Climate Migration. This is a still from the image of one of the main characters who is um, an Inuit from Canada, who's ended up in the United States at a, at a, at a place for um, climate refugees. Throughout the book, I highlight democratic and collective art projects from around the world in order to build a new cultural commons from the perspective of women, queer, post-colonial and indigenous artists and filmmakers who acknowledge and celebrate human interdependence and, um, and the non-human world. Some work, some artists in this book collaborate with scientists and present their work outside the gallery or the laboratory. Um, Judith Hosko, who's the Nest speaker in her work from an unknown explorer, works with a biologist and introduces the politics of non-human agential power through attention to tiny creatures in the Antarctic Ocean, like the sea angel and sea bar the fly, as does Ursula Beeman in her 2015 experimental film um, titled Sub-Atlantic on water chemistry and submerged landscapes. She focuses on microorganisms in the water that are important genetic materials that were le released from the ice over 400,000 years ago. Combining science fiction and documentary, she pays more attention to um, non-human actors and their powerful agency in shaping contemporary political landscapes. In another short experimental film, um, titled Deep Weather from Beeman um, in 2013. She connects the search for fossil fuels in tar sands in Canada and Alberta to its unexpected consequences on post-colonial South Asia with the poor and marginalized indi indigenous Bangladeshis as, as its most violently affected victims. Working with indigenous communities on the front lines of environmental and climate disaster, her video essay makes imaginable a crisis that is geographically dispersed and complex, often, often punishing those least able to recover and respond. Others who work in the Arctic and collaborate with indigenous communities include Sambhanka Banerjee, a well-known Indian photographer, scholar, and activist who teaches at the University of, of New Mexico. And he is one of the first artists 
and writers on the Alaskan Arctic to develop a form of environmental art photography in collaboration with indigenous communities. He reimagines what counts as data in the context of fake oil and the resurgence of territorial empire in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Banerjee's use of color photography to portray four seasons of life on the refuge record both endangered life and the changing temporality of the seasons, particularly around the area where drilling would take place. And I just want to point out too, um, not all of his photographs are aerial like these. Um, many of them are photographs of indigenous in, in these areas. Energy's work, though, came to public attention when his early photographs from the Arctic National Wild Refuge, the largest remaining stretch of wilderness in the U.S., were first used as evidence in a bitterly contested Senate debate in March 2003 over whether it should be open for oil drilling. His work um, reframed the way we visualize the Arctic over 12 month period and challenged the human center imperial depiction of the region as a frozen wasteland year round, put forth by then Senator Frank Murkowski, also the former, the late former governor of Alaska. In March 2002, in a moment of Senate theatrics in the US, Murkowski had held up a flat white post board and said, quote, this is a picture of the refuge as it exists for about nine months of the year. This is what it looks like. It's flat, it's unattractive, it's blank. Andrea Bauer's 2009 work, Mercy, Mercy Me, re-memorializes the struggle over the Exxon Valdez oil spill in Alaska in 1989 and its incomplete cleanup not from a scientific perspective, but from the point of view of both local indigenous and white community members who've had to live with the damage over generation, over generations. In Ken Saro Wewa's last words, the beadwork of the banner was created in collaboration with Gwich'in and white artists, and, it words, and its words refer to the famous speech of the Nigerian writer and environmental activist Ken Saro Wewa, who led a nonviolent campaign against the degradation of land and abuse of his people by Shell. The banner reads, Lord, take my soul, but the struggle continues. Her work is a dark commentary on how insubstantial and incomplete demonstrations and protests are and how work for social change is often forgotten and erased by the inevitable next catastrophe. She is interested in representing what Subankar Banerjee calls quote unquote long environmentalism. In the case of an environmental degradation that has lasted a quarter century and the way it has created a history and a culture and an art of its own. Lillian Ball um, marks that longer historical frame by compiling and analyzing data on the dwindling Arctic ice cap from 1990 to 2040. Um, drawing on already available data and extensive research that includes collaboration with scientists and conversations with local indigenous um, people. Still other artists do creative activism in the museums or in the streets and join collective environmental social movements around the world in chapters building on the galvanizing effect of continuing concern over past oil spills and imminent climate emergencies. The work of activist artists um, at, as, uh, such as Liberate Tate working in Britain in this piece License to Spill, um, the British Platform Collective and Not an Alternative working from Brooklyn, New York. And this is um, called Expedition Bus from 2015. All these works aim at holding Western art, natural, his, natural history and science museums to account for their complicity through the solicitation and acceptance of corporate sponsorship in enabling climate change and perpetuating the colonial narratives that underlie it. And including, and also including activist groups like I Don't Know More and Shell Know, and this image is, was taken in um, Seattle, Washington at a protest over Arctic drilling in 2015. The book also highlights the ongoing structural transformation of artistic work from outside conventional art institutions in relation to climate justice politics. 
All these artists and filmmakers emphasize the role of an artistic and literary imagination to question routine assumptions about the natural world and its future, simultaneously challenging the political and social assumptions of European and Western masculinist colonial practices. Much of the work discussed in the book is embodied, situated and embodied literally quote unquote down to earth as Bruno, Bruno Latour, the late Bruno Latour puts it, addressing earthly, even lowly or humble materials such as water, ice, dirt and microscopic marine life that artists nevertheless treat with care and imagination, imagination through reuse and recycling. The book foregrounds justice attentive aesthetic research practices that artists incorporate into art to explore conceptions of beauty, troubling environmental truths and ethical challenges that come with living in an unstable and contingent finite world. As the planet is proving more and more uninhabitable though, the heroic ethos has returned with a vengeance to overcome planetary catastrophe. The heroic is understood as a reactionary political and cultural stance that seeks to claim lost wilderness and to reassert control over nature, often in league with modern techno fix fantasies linked to further industry deregulation of environmental protection and the belief in an infinite horizon. Some of the ideas from the heroic legacy of polar exploration, notions of sublime wilderness, imperial conquest, and geographic extremes massive resource extraction, scientific adventure, and the review and renewal of masculine selfhood tested against a so-called hostile environment have returned in our current ideas, which also include fantasies. These include space exploration as colonization by some of the world's richest men, such as Jeff Bezos, Richard Branson, and Elon Musk, who dream of escaping to Mars to start a settlement colony from Earth. The science makes it clear, though, that there is no escape to the heavens, no planet B, as the activists say, and the book very much focuses on this world that we actually inhabit, even though polar exploration was, for an earlier time, the equivalent of space exploration. In both cases, the fantasy of ever-expanding resources and territory stemmed from a vividly colonialist imagination and a compulsion to repeat and discover more territory, more resources, more products for consumption, more profits. The book connects nascent and resurgent imperialist heroism and conquest in the polar regions to artistic responses to climate changes and the Earth's finitude. In doing so, the book concerns art and creates a new kind of imagination and seeks to find new footing within the Earth's limits grounded in existing um, social reality than starry-eyed fantasies of plundering or occupying other planets outside of our solar system. The book reprises and extends significant post-colonial and feminist scholarship from the past three decades on the visual culture of the Arctic and Antarctic. My 1993 book, Gender on Ice, American Ideologies of Polar Expedition, described how American and British explorers in the early 20th century perceived the poles as a proving ground for a colonial masculinity and as an empty imperial frontier to plunder, quote, a tabula rasa where people, history, and culture vanish. Gender on Ice was one of the first books to bring Arctic studies into a lesser extent Antarctic studies into conversation with critical intersectional feminist scholarship on gender, race, science, art, colonialism, and nationalism. Much of my feminist and post-colonial writing on the art of these regions since then has built on this initial foray, including um, the International Conference and online journal issue of the Scholar and Feminist from Barnard College in New York City on gender and the polar regions that I collaborated on many years ago um, with Elena Glassberg and Laura Kay in 2008, as well as more recent articles on fem feminism, colonialism, art, and ecology, which I developed further in some cases in this book. Um, and I just wanted to show you a few just to give you other important, um, give you a wider sense of some of the wonderful scholarship happening in this field. Um, and this book on Arctic, Arctic environmental modernities from 2018. Um, this um, also wonderful book, Arctic Archives, Ice, Memory and Entropy, 
and on Antarctica, the handbook on the politics of Antarctica, which is going into a second edition um, um, uh, soon because so much has changed on this topic since it was published in 2017. Um, other books on the on visual culture and contemporary art that I recommend include this Rutledge Companion by T.J. Demas, Emily Eliza Scott, and Subhankar Banerjee as editors. This um, wonderful new anthology on art and activism in the 21st century. And finally, um, this um, book that just recently came out, it's a companion to contemporary art in a global framework edited by Jane Chin Davidson and Amelia Jones. And I have articles in all, all these books, but I wanted to show you their covers. Um, finally, I wanted to mention um, my collaboration over the years, including um, with Elena Glassberg, the author of Antarctica as Cultural Critique, The Gendered Politics of Scientific Exploration and Climate Change, and she collaborated with me on chapters four and five of this book. Um, so I just wanted to say that some artists, um, some more on the book of how some artists in the book recover the history of women's, the Inuits and African-American men's involvement in polar exploration using fictional approaches that imagine alternate histories and that they revitalize these older heroic narratives from the perspective of subjects who were historically excluded or whose involvement was ignored. Ursula Le Guin's speculative utopian short story, um, Sir from 1982, influenced several artists discussed in the book, including Judith Herskos, whose performance piece follows my talk, and um, Isaac Julian's reformulation of the African-American polar um, um, Matthew Henson in her in his piece titled True North um, not only makes Henson's accomplishments part of North polar exploration but creates a new fictional persona for him that challenges mainstream homophobic narratives of imperial heroics. Um, and, um, and then finally, um, Swedish artist Kasia Aglet in her conceptual project Winter Event Anna Fries uses a variety of media and aesthetic techniques to unsettle colonialist and nationalist masculinist history as the major, major mode of engagement in the Arctic till this day. Even though the poles were at times presented through a tra more traditional Western aesthetics of landscape painting and photography that represented these regions as beyond the cal calculable and measurable and the appeal to the sublime and wilderness. Um, as you can see, I and a growing group of scholars and artists point out such a view of pristine nature in these regions can often be counterproductive. Such an idealization of wilderness is not merely a myth, but in the case of the Arctic continues to be used to justify indigenous absence rather than presence, and even extend such older aesthetic strategies in art, film, and visual culture in this new era. So I'm, I wanna conclude with my epilogue and just say that um, despite the acceleration of climate change in recent years, countries worldwide, continue to pump out the emissions that cause catastrophic climate change and the world remains far off track to avoid catastrophic unraveling as the UN climate change report um, suggests um, that at our current global pace of carbon emissions, the world will burn through its remaining carbon budget by 2030. Yet even as the impact of climate breakdown comes to be felt everywhere, government climate policy is woefully inadequate and the urgency of the crisis is still not getting through. Um, in the midst of this inadequate response, um, the art, however, the artists and filmmakers discuss, discuss find a way to integrate climate activism, aesthetics, and scientific fact using the often um, suppressed and largely ignored evidence of climate change in these regions, the artist presents a more nuanced and accurate picture of the Anthropocene's planetary scope as one of connectedness and finitude. Um, I wanna conclude with um, my cover image of my book um, by the New Zealand artist and photographer, Joyce Campbell, who did the book's cover, who did the book cover using outdated technologies on um, the daguerreotype and borrows from the Gothic list of the sublime taken from the 19th century, taken from like 19th century romantic landscape paintings to rethink the role of art in grappling with issues of the Anthropocene. 
There is Terror, but also Rage and Campbell's 2006 de Derek daguerreotype photograph titled Ice School of a Seeming Screaming Face of a Melting Glacier taken in the Ross Sea region of Antarctica. But Ice School also makes us think how climate change is precisely like the Gothic that haunts our everyday life through repetitions of cause and effect and the way it is always there in a liminal and uncanny presence in our times. The epilogue, seeing, the, seeing from the future, extends the book's thesis stating the world continues to remain off track, to avoid catastrophic un unraveling, to inspire us to interrogate the future we are creating. I link it to the works of artists and activists discussed in the book who are engaged in political ecological discourses that treat that treat the alt climate crisis as an immediate emergency of the future. The book concludes by asking what other future for the world might be possible by recognizing the polar now made now made perceptible through the new polar aesthetics. Um, and thank you um, for listening. <laughs> Okay, thank you okay. so much, Lisa. Can you? Um, I'm going to stop the share. Okay. Yeah, great. Okay. okay. So um, now Judith Hersko will be performing and she has a request for us. Judith, you're muted. Unmute. Hi, everyone. I want to thank Cheryl and Lisa for inviting me to be part of this panel and Victor Pa for his um, larger work on the context. And I will, in service of time, I will just jump in there and present uh, an excerpt uh, from the pages from the book of the Unknown Explorer that is described in Lisa's book. So what I'm asking everyone to do is to please focus on the images that I'm going to share. I'm going to make myself disappear and um, we will all turn off our cameras. And if you could, for 10 minutes, indulge me and just focus on the shared screen and um, my words will be in the background. Thank you very much. And here comes the share. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Yes, yes, you can. All right. So without further ado, let me present pages from the Unknown Explorer. Let me introduce you to Anna Schwartz. Seen here in a silicone portrait from the Stephenson archives at Dartmouth. She's an unknown explorer, the only woman to make it onto a US Antarctic expedition before 1960s, in Budapest, Hungary. At the age of 12, she received a box camera that sealed her fate. Her first photograph, was published in a newspaper, and by age 15, she had developed her obsession with phenomena of life, shadow, and transparency. Schwartz was also an avid naturalist. She admired the German-born Maria Sibylla Marian, who was the first person to observe and document the metamorphosis of butterflies, and who voyaged from Amsterdam to Suriname in South America in 1699 to search for exotic caterpillars. Schwartz too was enamored by butterflies, but of a different kind. The Limacina halicina, or sea butterfly, here seen embedded in her portrait, is a pteropod, a shelled planktonic snail that is abundant in the Southern Oceans, together with its predator, the Cleone Antarctica, or sea angel. The Limacina halicina is the sole food source of the Cleona Antarctica, and thus their existence is intricately linked. The symbioses of these organisms, as well as their transparency, captivated Schwartz. She wanted to be the first one to photograph the light coming through their bodies and shells, and she was prepared to go to great lengths to achieve this. In 1938, Schwartz crossed the ocean to visit her distant cousin, Evelyn Schwartz, who was born and raised in New York. By the late 1930s, Evelyn worked closely with Wilhelm und Stephenson, the famous and controversial polar explorer whom she later married. When Schwartz arrived in New York, a series of events unfolded that are detailed in her letter sent home in November, 1939. In this letter, 
She describes how through a number of fortunate incidents, Evelyn was able to help her join Admiral Byrd's third Antarctic expedition. The man lined up for the job of recording scientific data through photography and typing fell ill and the expedition needed someone urgently, present in the right place at the right time and possessing some of the right skills, Schwartz got the job. She had to disguise herself as a man, which proved to be awkward and unsustainable. Hence, she returned with the first ship that set sail to the US from Antarctica on March 20, 1940. During her short stay, Schwartz made heroic attempts to capture images of the planktonic snails. While her male comrades were busy preparing to map the vast heroic landscape with the aid of airplanes and the monstrous snow cruiser, that proved to be a technological failure. Schwartz sat huddled at the microscope with the sea angel and the sea butterfly. Despite the fact that in 1934, Fritz Zernike invented the phase contrast microscope that allowed for the study of colorless and transparent biological materials, she was not able to capture them on film as such equipment was not yet available in Antarctica. Instead, she took to making invisible embroideries and drawings inspired by the crates, assorted objects, and detritus scattered in the Terra Nova hut. Schwartz later branched out to create invisible objects that are part of the archives today, including this wedding photograph of Kathleen and Robert Falcon Scott on a translucent paper vase. For now, we leave Schwartz in Scott's Terra Nova hut at Cape Evans, where she shared the space of former explorers and worked in her Perponting's dark room. That's the dark room in the background, the open door. Fast forward 65 years to San Diego, California, where Schwartz's daughter and artist decides to finish what her mother had begun. She teams up with Dr. Victoria Fabry, who studies the effects of ocean acidification on calcifying organisms such as pteropods. Dr. Fabry welcomes the opportunity to communicate her findings through art as she feels she's unable to reach the general public with her scientific publication. She entices Schwartz's daughter with stunning images of pteropods, the dream of Anna Schwartz come true. Most exciting are the representations of the Limacina Halicina, including motion pictures taken through the microscope. Schwartz's daughter reads a recent article Dr. Fabry co-authored, which was published in the 2005 September issue of Nature. This article describes how the increased level of carbon dioxide, CO2, produced by human activity, primarily the burning of fossil fuels in the manufacturing of products and the driving of vehicles is causing changes in ocean chemistry. Carbon dioxide does not stay where it is produced, but spreads in the atmosphere equally across the globe. It is absorbed by the oceans everywhere and causes ocean acidification. Even the shells of live planktonic snails dissolve under acidity levels predicted for the near future. These effects are occurring much more rapidly than previously expected, especially in the cold waters of high latitudes. In the Ross Sea, where the Limacina, Helicina, and the Cleona Antarctica live, there is not much time left before the shells of organisms will dissolve. Schwartz's daughter ponders the equations, maps, tables, charts, and computer simulations. She views Dr. Fabry's PowerPoint presentation showing the future of the oceans in regards to aragonite saturation. Putting all of this together, she understands that aragonite is the stable form of calcium carbonate, the material necessary for shelves to form. In these charts, high concentration of aragonite is indicated by warm colors, red, orange, and yellow while low concentration is rep represented by cool colors, green, blue, and purple, purple indicating the lowest concentration. As the dissolution of CO2 in the waters lowers the concentration of 
aragonite, the limacina halicina, as well as corals and all manners of creatures with shells are in danger of simply disappearing with potentially catastrophic effects on the entire marine food chain. Schwartz's daughter takes the data and turns it back to matter. She casts sculptures in calcium carbonate, the substance of shells, and submerges them in acid. She logs acidity, temperature, and weight as she watches the surfaces break up and dissolve. The experiments culminate in an installation, shifting baselines, where she visualizes Dr. Fabry's data onto tanks of live jellyfish. She projects the three minute clip of Nicholas Rogue's movie Insignificance, showing Einstein's vision of the Hiroshima explosion. And in seven days of dissolution, she demonstrates the effects of ocean acidification. This piece consists of a carbon dioxide tank that pipes into a system of seven 12 by 12 inch containers that hold water and black sea fans. Onto the sea fans, she has crafted sculptures of a human heart and lung constructed from capiz shells. As viewers walk from left to right, they find the heart and lung gradually dissolving and disappearing until the sea fan is empty in the seventh tank. When shifting baselines opens, Dr. Fabry is absent. She's in Antarctica sampling pteropods and their reaction to acidity. The following season, Schwartz's daughter is able to follow in her footsteps on the way to Cape to finally meet and the sea butterfly. She stops at Cape Evans. The it's frozen, Judith. And her lens. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just at the end, it froze a little bit. But I think it did? You know, most of it was perfect. Yeah, just at the end, the sound went off briefly and the image got um, frozen briefly, just right at the I'm end. I'm sorry. No problem. Oh, wow. That was really great. Um, so yeah. now um, I'd like to um, to give everybody a chance to formulate a question that they might have for either of our speakers. And um, you could raise your hand in, um, in under reaction, there's a little hand raise um, symbol that you can use, or if you prefer, you could type it into the chat and I can, I can ask the question for you. So um, please, uh, we'd love to hear from you and um, in the meantime, I think I'll throw out a question, which is, um, uh, Lisa, you were mentioning that uh, some of some of the art and the intervention doesn't get through. Um, so I was wondering, what would it take to get through, and how does um, performance art um, like Judith's? Which is so amazing and um, fictional, right, Judith? Uh, that's that it's based on research, um, but it's but it's largely fictional. Um, Do you want me to answer that? <laughs> uh, well, first, I'd like Lisa to talk about what what kind of um, what kind of artistic activism do you think is most effective in these desperate times? And then um, for Judith, uh, my question is. 
uh, how did you come up with this process of um, combining research with fiction with performance? Okay, that's a, that's a wonderful question. And I'm, it's a question that many of us, I think are asking ourselves um, since so much, since a lot of times um, museums and galleries are not showing this kind of work. And, you know, the wonderful thing about Judith's work is it kind of bypasses these structures because she can do it on Zoom and she can do it in a wide range of environments. And I feel like, that's actually extremely effective. Um, and, um, you know, and I am currently doing a project on um, conversations on com climate change through an intersectional lens. And I'm working with students and we're doing interviews with artists who are activists, climate activists, um, and trying to, you know, get, hear more of their stories about whether their work is getting through and how and um, what forms it takes. and. And I feel like, you know, it's part of a study that's precisely on this question. So um, I think, um, you know, you know, it, it's, it's hard to say, but it's a very important, a significant thing. And I've been, um, you know, talking to artists like um, Kim Ano, who literally does film and video pieces that she shows to, um, you know, the sort of people who are going to work, walk in climate marches and to activists to get them thinking and get them going. So I feel artists are being very resourceful. And, um, you know, as you can see from some of the images I showed you at climate pr protest marches, in terms of using art and aesthetics in all kinds of ways that isn't confined to the museum or the gallery. Thank you. Judith. All right, so um, actually, um, I would say that it's 80% nonfiction. <laughs> okay and very small percentage fiction. The, the fiction part is introducing uh, Anna Schwartz into the story, but all the other material, the uh, all the all everything else is, is factual. I've just woven it together. So I, I guess I, I call it historical fiction. Mm -hmm. You know, those books that are based on actual documents and people's letters and so on, but they have to weave together the facts with sort of uh, fictitious uh, transitions, so to speak. Now it's actually called auto fiction. It's a new genre that combines say memoir and fiction for exactly that, because um, sometimes when you're writing a memoir or about family, uh, you have to fill in parts with speculation. Mm -hmm. So. There you go. So, so I guess uh, it's also auto fiction, but in this case, it's historical fiction mostly. Although I do use my mother as my unknown explorer. So those images and the biography of Anna Schwartz uh, corresponds to my mother's. Except she didn't go to uh, Antarctica or did any of this trip that I described. She was a photographer. So that is her biography, images of her, et cetera, and, and her first photograph. So that is also uh, um, actually factual in terms of her bio, but she just never uh, visited Antarctica. But everything else, the research about the uh, machine they took to Antarctica or that expedition or all the people mentioned are real and they happened at the time as mentioned. And the science, and that is what I like to point out most, is absolutely factual. So the science and the organisms and all that was done in collaboration with my scientific collaborators. And I continue doing that kind of work. So that part has absolutely zero fiction in it. Well, that's great that you were able to collaborate with scientists, because I find, um, unfortunately, a lot of times the disciplinary boundaries make it very difficult for people in the arts and humanities to collaborate with scientists, because it doesn't count for them as much, you know, like how they need to get certain types of publications. That's what I've encountered. So it's, I think it's so great that you were able to successfully do this. Thank you. So um, we'd love to have some comments or questions from the rest of you.
Anybody? Um, if not, um, yeah, there is one. one. There is one in the chat. Oh, great. Okay, fantastic. Okay. Um, so Lucian wants to know how could we continue to represent climate change and the Arctic, or more in general, the beauty of nature without participating to a zoo effect, increasing tourism and pollution? Good question. Yeah. Uh, and I'll throw into that, you know, like, um, to me, it's very disturbing that there's now cruise ships going to Antarctica, bringing all these people there, uh, you know, like uh, cl climate change tourism or disaster tourism, as it's called. Yeah, I, I would say that is a huge concern, especially in Antarctica. And I'm very interested. I think this is going to be part of this new um, book on the politics of Antarctica to speak back to that because it's a very fragile environment. And um, and they've been able to, you know, keep the tourism on the periphery. Um, but um, I think there's a, lots of exceptions and I, I don't know all the details and I'm looking forward to the next, the second edition of that book. Um, yeah, I think um, somehow, you know, I tell people, you know, these days you do not have to go to these regions to know that climate change is real. I mean, that moment has really passed. Um, and, um, and so, you know, there's so much, if you're looking for, you know, the degradation of the environment, there's so much you can see these days, sadly. And, um, and I think, um, you know, and as, you know, and as I said, I feel it's connected to this kind of, um, you know, sort of desire to be heroic and go there and a continuing fascination with these explorers and that culture and in keeping with, you know, this fantasy around space exploration. And, you know, it's also about the infinite and transcendence in a certain way. And many people have a hard time coming to grips with this finite world that we're actually living in. And, um, and that, that changes a lot of things. It doesn't offer the transcendence that people want. Um, it's, you know, it's the, the people don't want to hear that we're really dealing with a lot of limits these days. And, um, and how are we going to act on that in, you know, in very in productive ways and accept it? Some of it also seems what I call elegiac, like an elegy to something that's dying. That I yeah. think the um, part of the reason why some people want to be tourists to these places is they want to watch it before it melts. Yeah. But, um, it yeah, but absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, I think yeah. that's that's not helpful at this point. <laughs> it may yeah. be something that they want to have the experience of, so it may not be heroic, but it's still um, somehow it's um, it's adding a footprint where it doesn't need additional footprint. <laughs> yeah. uh, Justin, let's hear from you. Unmute yourself. Um, hi, Lisa. I'm such a, a huge fan. Uh, Gender and ISO is like really important uh, to me and in my art practice. And so I, I think a lot about um, the heroic uh, narrative a lot uh, on the one hand, and then sort of I've been thinking more t recently about the sort of reperformance, I guess, sort of of um, that kind of colonialism through what might be considered like a neo-colonial perspective in terms of yeah. how images are captured of these places now generally by cis white guys with like really expensive equipment and sort of you know what those um sort of just like what's that sort of looking like and I guess I'm I'm curious what your thoughts are on that and then also sort of how maybe the internet or the proliferation of images online maybe contributes to or is in conversation to some of those issues yeah well so great questions yeah I mean there's sort of lots of examples of what you're talking about um and you know, I feel not as it's 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 not as extreme now as it was originally. Um, you know, and it was earlier. I think before COVID, where you had photographers. You know, where the subject was around their heroism because they were literally, you know, photographing the the shrinking glaciers and all these things and putting their lives at risk. And you know, and a number of you know climate scientists have indeed died. You know doing their science in these regions. So 
Um, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to, you know, erase their achievements and what they've accomplished at the same time and label everything, you know, under this negative label of the heroic. But um, so I feel like, you know, there's been a lot of good work done as well. But I feel like, you know, I mean, I know I have colleagues who are thinking about this in terms of its relationship to climate protests and, you know, and, um, and the response to climate change, which is forcing us into a very difficult position, um, you know, and um, where we have to think about issues around, you know, violence and protests and, and how are we going to get the world to stop, um, you know, so, so I feel like um, so the heroic is is, a, is complicated um, for sure, um, and and it's important to also think about um, you know what we're going to have to do to to change things. Um, you know what I like about the art is it doesn't you know the art like Judith's work. Um, I like many things about her work, but um, but also for people to have time to really contemplate this in a way that isn't extreme like the culture has become you know the nuances the beauty that you know and take all this in as well and um and not lose that to you know so so i just feel like we're in a very difficult moment and um and there aren't many good answers um you know i mean it's interesting like um the 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 film we had a sort of film go mainstream on how to blow up a pipeline by Andrea Andrea's mom. I mean, you know, we're we're seeing very different things happening in the culture. We have another level of activism that was going taking place in museums around the world and at sporting events and and I just you know in I you know as you can see I've done this work over a long period of time and um and what I have to say is really that um I think people only wake up when they themselves are impacted by um a, a hurricane or um a fires or something like that and that's seemingly what it takes and now most of the world is getting impacted this way so I'm that more than anything I think has woken people up and ma making them realize we're living in a finite world that that doesn't mean that the fantasies aren't still out of control they certainly are but anyway so that's a limited <laughs> it's a big question so thank you for yeah. it uh, we have another have question. question in the chat. Um, let's see. Stephanie Kane. Is ice in particular inspiring for certain genres of art? I'll, I'll let you to speak to that. <laughs> well, certainly to me, it is inspiring because I'm obsessed with transparencies and um, if, things that melt and change, obviously. So when I was in Antarctica, I did um, bring some sculptural molds, again, of family, actually, and cast them in ice. I thought that they would freeze outside in Antarctica, but this is to the point of the whole issue here. It was too warm in Antarctica that summer, it's our winter, of course, that I was there in 2008, December and 2009, January, it was too warm for, for this ice sculpture to form outside. Oh, so wow. I had to actually put it in the freezer. I have pictures of people in Antarctica that summer who like stripped halfway, you know, to show the warmth of the weather in the sun. I mean, it was crazy. My family at the time, I think, was in Hungary for, for Christmas, and it was colder there than where I was in Antarctica in December. Of course, it was summer, but nevertheless, it was um, so to the point of, of climate change. It was uh, insanely warm considering where I was most of the time. Um, so, but to go back to the question, ice is a very seductive material, obviously. And I actually love, love that film that Lisa showed one image of where you saw the polar bear fashioned in, in ice. Do you, do you all remember that image? That, um, that movie is, is just a beautiful experimental piece. I really recommend for people to see it. And it really does use ice very effectively as a medium within the film to to drive home 
the emotional layers and and the issues at hand. It's a very powerful piece. And with that, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It was called That Which Once Was, and um, and it's done by an amazing, actually, I think, Japanese-American um, filmmaker who lives in New York City. Um, and, um, and I think you can find it online, actually, so. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Lisa, could you post the open access link? For I'm going to try uh -huh. and see if it lets me, um, I, it is on my website. So I think that's probably the best way to get it. Um, and um, under uh, www.lisaebloom.com, it's on the top part of the chat, but um, it's, it's all over there. And I was just feel so lucky that I was able to get the book open access. So um, yeah. Um, it's easy, or you just go to the Duke University Press site and type in my um, the title of my book, and you can get it that way. That's so great. That yeah, that means more people can have access to exactly. it. Exactly. You no, know, it's wonderful, and it was yeah. it was a surprise yeah. actually at the last minute. I wasn't expecting this, but was wishing for it. But mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Okay. Uh, any. Any other comments or questions? All right, well, um, thank you all for coming today. And um, this has been recorded. So um, uh, uh, Helsinki Environmental Humanities Month, we'll have probably a link to it if you are interested in that.